Tripoli. Tripoli is a serious illness spread by infected mosquitoes. We had a very active Tripoli season in 2019, and because this disease comes in two to three year cycles, we want to be sure you know how to protect yourself and your loved ones. Our strategies to control mosquitoes include spraying from trucks and from the air to kill adult mosquitoes. Spraying can help temporarily reduce mosquito populations and their ability to spread the virus. The spray does not persist in the environment. When done at the right time and with good weather, aerial spraying can be useful as a risk reduction tool, but it does not and cannot eliminate that you risk. Need them. That's how you get berries, nuts, seeds, all the different food items that we eat that goes into one third of our diet. Pollination from bees helps sustain a third of our food supply. But Mary Phillips with the National Wildlife Federation says those bees and our food are now under threat thanks to two new policies from the Trump administration. It's very uh, daunting and frustrating um, to see. The EPA just reapproved a pesticide scientists say is especially harmful to bees. The Obama administration banned it back in 2014 to protect an already dwindling population of honeybees. And what effect the pesticide will have on bees may be harder to track because the USDA is also suspending its quarterly count of bee populations and disease outbreaks. More than one third of the world's crop production is dependent on bee pollination. They are the most important pollinators of our fruits, vegetables and flowers. Did you know that without bees, it is predicted that humans will only have four years to live? In recent years, we have seen a decline in the bee population on a global scale. Pesticides are affecting the bees both lethally and sublethally and is thought to be one of the main contributing factors of colony collapse disorder, which was first identified in 2007. Every batch of pollen that a honeybee carries home as food has at least six detectable pesticides in it. Neonic pesticides are currently the most commonly used and controversial. Their main difference to most other pesticides is that they are systemic, meaning that they are absorbed by the plant and are present in all areas of the plant. The honeybee takes in the pesticide with the pollen. Bees are a superorganism, meaning they are a social unit which have a highly organised division of labour. They rely on the colony as a collective unit to survive. The process of foraging is a highly complex phenomenon comprising coordinated individual performances. Sublethal effects of pesticides are known to negatively impair bee behaviours such as foraging efficacy, communication dances, orientation and return flights. Poor individual performance leads to poor population dynamics of the whole colony. We're up here in the wooded area of Point Loma, and this is a non-commercial beehive. Now, the couple that has this beehive has two others, and they've been doing this for over three, even four decades. But one of the two other beehives, it's critically ill. So we had a look in the hive, and we found hundreds of dead bees on the ground outside the hive. This is one of the two healthy hives the Terrans tend. It was back on August 10th when they saw signs of the poisoning. And then a couple of days later, the layer of dead bees outside was maybe two, three inches thick. Um, and there were more sick bees all around the hive. The die-off was devastating. Before this happened, when we looked in it, we would estimate that there were somewhere around 40, 50,000 bees. Now there are probably four or 5,000 bees left in it. Don believes the poisoning happened accidentally when insecticide was sprayed on flowering plants. Um, honeybees will choose to forage up to a mile away from the hive. Then the bees would pick up that insecticide and take it back to the hive and poison the hive from the inside. Well, this is uh, evidence of toxic chemicals, probably neonicotinoids. This is kind of what I experienced last year. Got shadow there. Put it over here. This is a fairly young bee. It's not that old. And they really act sick. They they bounce around when they walk, they kind of don't walk very well. This is not from virosis, this is from toxic chemicals. Pretty much acts normal, but it's not normal. I don't have a lot of these, but enough to make an impact on the colony strength in my colonies. 
See, that's not right. Insects don't die like that naturally. This is man-made chemicals doing this to this bee. And what they do is they walk out of the hive and they manage to get away from the hive aways and don't ne they don't necessarily die in the hive so you don't know that you're bun you have a bunch of bees dying because they're not in the hive anymore. They wander out and die elsewhere. It's just a sad thing to watch. It really should be criminal what's going on in this country that corporate America, mostly the bear companies involved in making the neonicotinoids. And with the effect that it's having on honeybees like this, you know it's got to cause cancer in humans. It just takes a few years. Because bees are very sensitive to environment. They die quickly from stuff like this. In humans, it takes a while. But that's just not not good. And we humans don't do anything about it. Or us, us regular people, the rich people, are ones that are doing this to us. Us regular people, we don't seem to speak up and protest. Beekeepers don't want to seem to get together and protest and uh, boycott the almonds in California to make a statement. Every time I talk to a commercial beekeeper, try to get them to do that. It's, oh, we need the money. Money's more important than anything else. Look at that poor bee. Probably just started foraging the last few days and got to the wrong flowers. Flowers that had neonicotinoids on them. It really pisses me off. If the government ever collapses, I'm gonna go around and take out a bunch of crop farmers. I got a list of crop farmers in the area that have been uh, poisoning me and my wife for many years. Payback's a bitch. Good afternoon, good day, wherever you might be. I am Sandy Shellis and welcome to Environmental Coffee House. I see that a lot of you have joined um, today. This topic on, uh, what is it, June 11th, 2020. In a lot of places, the weather's changing, summer's coming. There's, um, there's, mosquitoes out and what got me thinking about this topic and and it was two things twofold I was outside a lot I've been outside a lot I live outside uh, in this weather and I I uh I I got bit I have a big bite on my neck and a bite on my face and I got bit then what happens I got bit and it, and an article just it popped up about a deadly mosquito-borne illness is brewing in the Northeast that happened last year, E-E-E, -E -E. and we'll read about that, um, this equine thingy. But it's deadly, and 40% of the people that get bitten that get it, they die. And we're in the midst of a pandemic, COVID. So we're, we're, we're seeing these things, and we see Zika, we see um, uh, all of... All of the, the, what is it, West Nile, these viruses that happen, and they're brought from <clears throat> mosquito-borne illnesses. I mean, there's countries you go and you take, you know, hydrochloroquine for malaria, which is what it was originally, and people have netting all around everything because the, uh, the um, mosquitoes. Now, in the United States, and maybe a lot of places around the world, pesticide use is heavy. And they, and what, what introduced me to this again was my distaste and dislike for spraying neighborhoods. No matter what 
the state health departments say, and Massachusetts in the United States is starting to spray. But uh, the people have to know that this affects wildlife and bees and fish. And they say it's safe. But at what cost? What's the cost benefit analysis of, I think it was 100 people have died since 1938 when they discovered this EEE? That's the, not a lot of people, but yet we're destroying the environment because of it. So I'm going to say good morning. Hi, Shelly. It's so nice to see you. Jean, I love bees too. I do. And Karen, hi, Karen. And um, Mike, and good, this is great. This is great. You know, um, and Rich, sick bees are a harbinger of a poison world. When will we ever learn? Yeah, well, we're going to start out with this one article. We're not going to learn. We're not going to learn, but we are going to learn. You guys and me. We're going to learn. We're going to review. We're going to talk about these issues. I'm a lifelong learner. And if I didn't have an ability to be a lifelong learner, I don't know what, what life I'd have. So here we go. This is the article that got me started on this. And it was in, it came through from uh, Medium. A deadly mosquito-borne illness is brewing in the Northeast. And it kills almost half its victims. Now, I'm, I'm not going to read the whole thing because I have a lot of stuff to go through. But it was talking about this family and what happened to them as a result of this. Uh, somebody got very sick and had an inflammation of the brain. This person contracted the Eastern Equine Encephalitis, EEE virus. And it actually was uh, around last year. It, it really reared its ugly head last year. And it is from a mosquito bite. I mean, there's mosquitoes, there's ticks, there's you know, everything. So the guy said, well, he had heard about it in Massachusetts, was in the middle of its worst outbreak in almost a century. I wonder why these are happening. There is no vaccine or no treatment for this virus. And while transmission is rare, the infection is around 400 times deadlier than the flu. So those that contract this EEE, they'll die approximately 40% of the time. And as I said before, I read it here, it was, uh, I think, 1938, there have been fewer than 100 cases in Massachusetts. They're going to spray anyway. Uh, the, and, and this guy, his diagnosis was 10 cases in last year, in 2019. So it would be eclipsed by an outbreak of the coronavirus, right? But this is happening all at once. These things are going up. The EEE outbreak, it spread across Connecticut, Rhode Island, New Jersey, and Michigan, and, and, and interrupted the rhythm of everyday life in the Northeast. Although, I will tell you guys, didn't interrupt me. <laughs> I barely flinched. There's just so many topics to choose from. Uh, so, any, if a preview of the lockdown this year, public health officials made recommendations to shelter indoors and avoid certain activities at dawn and dusk. Oh, gosh. So the outbreak, it was tracked by uh, entomologists and epidemiologists in the region. But, but it said that the season was consistent with the historical be behavior of the virus. And it's got sporadic peaks, but um, uh, maybe it's a change in climate. Yeah, that could be it. We were always outside, always all summer long since we were kids and we never had a problem, right? right? So since the 1980s, scientists had warned that if, a, if global temperatures rose significantly, that disease-laden mosquitoes would extend their reach into previously unaffected ecologies around the world, increasing rates of infection in large swaths of the planet's population. So it's where I live today. The Northeast is among the fastest warming regions in the United States. Milder winters, which I will testify to, and intense summers. Let's see, the last two days were almost 90. 
Then we got a thunderstorm last night. And now it's 63. Weather whiplash, unbelievable. But people were wondering if that 2019 outbreak of this, the virulent future is already here. A microcosmic omen, you know, an omen presaging a new and terrifying epidemiology epidemiological reality. Now, I'm not meaning to scare you, but these things, they're happening. And we're, we're, we've already been scared and terrified by the media enough over uh, coronavirus. But I'm just going to give you some facts on these things, and we're going to sway over to the bees, which I love the bees. And all this started was because of mosquito bites on me and this article popping up. Oh, so this guy got really sick and they didn't even know if he was 58 years old. They didn't even know if he was going to live. And, you know, he said he was just overcome with anxiety. He was just thinking, we've always been outside. Why is this a problem? Why all of a sudden are we hearing that things are going to be different? And well, viruses, they're, they're a paradox of civilization. The protein and sconce splinters of DNA animate only uh, when infecting a host body, us. And my God, I have enough bites that I'm a host. <laughs> because, But I use some stuff from the Amish. I digress. <laughs> and it actually works pretty good. Uh, so these are so primitive that scientists cannot quite agree as to what side of the living non-living border they belong on as our species has acquired dominion over nature these zombies of the microscopic realm devoid of thought and culture they emerge from nowhere to upend our lives as if to remind us that our achievements are fleeting and fragile that apparent the apparent attainments of civilization makes us in some ways more vulnerable than ever. As our first agrarian ancestors enjoyed the food and labor of domesticated goats and chickens and pigs and oxen, they made a Faustian bargain. For the first time, they were suddenly exposed to zoonotic viruses, bugs that leap from animals into humans, producing terrifying infections measles, tuberculosis, pertussis, that hunter-gatherers had not known. For citizens of the great empires of the Iron Age, the price of urban life and rare species was novel colds, flus, pus-filled pox communicated along trade routes and in sputtering marketplaces. So as Europeans embarked on this global colonization quest, viruses were transported across hemispheres, overwhelming uh, great um, indigenous nations and civilizations whose citizenry had no immunity. It's impossible to exaggerate this cataclysm, which killed some 90% of the indigenous population in North America, a death toll so fast that some should suggest it led to a period of, of global cooling, as well as trafficking viruses across the seas via human and animal hosts. Trade and slave ship captains introduced disease-laden mosquitoes to the Americas, which sickened indigenous populations and colonists alike with yellow fever and new strains of malaria. And in the 18th century, summer was known as the, the sickly season, and citizens would stay inside to escape the humid air, which, according to the antique yet still prevailing uh, miasmic theory of disease thought to be ripe with invisible pestilence. It's a pretty good piece, huh? So it goes on to go from 1793, um, how they, after residents began to turn yellow and vomit blood and expire from the yellow fever. 1878, 5,500 uh, residents of Memphis died from the viral infection. So that was, uh, that was, well, awful, right? But once the mosquito was unmasked as the preeminent 
vector of viruses and the harvester of human populations controlling them became priority for humans. And so vast swamplands were drained. Pesticides like DDT, that would be getting them all right, Big Daddy DDT, they were wantonly sprayed. How did we live? How are we living? We're all dying. <laughs> right? Of cancer or some, some something that maybe they didn't die when they were hunter and gatherers, right? So the measures proved so extraordinarily effective that in the decades following World War II, the once deadly mosquitoes that plagued the United States became, for most citizens, nothing more than a summer nuisance. So it was the victory of science and organized public health over the mosquito. It, 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 it was what part of many believed to be the final coup of civilization over the infectious microbe. So in 1962, Sir McFarlane Burnett said the end of one of the most important social revolutions in history, the virtual elimination of infectious diseases as a significant factor in social life or so he thought. All right, well, we go forward. And uh, we, we find out that where EEE comes from and that it's complex. And the, 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 again, the first human case was recorded 107 years later when it, from 1831 when 25 people died from the infection. Now, remember, population was a lot, a lot lower then. And being that population was lower, you know, of course, it, it sounds like, well, it's not a lot of people that died, but 25 people in a smaller population might be. So this is a pretty good article. And it goes on to describe uh, 2003, how it started to come back. And that's when spraying, you know, they really, they really ramped up spraying again, infected horses. There were uh, it, first documented case in Vermont. And so it was spreading. It was spreading northward. Uh, okay, so we're going to go on to um, us, the mosquito. It is by far the deadliest creature on the planet. It really is. While extracting blood to nourish its eggs, the female mosquito kills approximately 1 million humans every year. Snakes come in second at around 50,000 humans killed. The infection caused by the malaria parasite remains the most lethal mosquito-borne disease claiming around 430,000 lives annually. This vast majority is carried by those living in sub-Saharan Africa where malaria, even with hydrochloroquine, if they can get it, is still endemic, reflecting a global reality where public health and clinical solutions to infectious disease have often been deployed first in wealthy nations. <sighs> oh, she, I, I had her in my video. She was talking about Dr. Catherine Brown, but they're talking about spraying and I really, I don't like it. I don't like what they spray, but you know, it's like, it's like the fight. What do you, what do you, it's like a fight against ourselves. It's either we get bit, we die, we spray, we kill everything else and we die. <laughs> and I don't mean to sound, you know, nihilistic or, 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 uh, or so negative, but it is, it's, it is. So, whoops. Uh, this being that it's the deadliest, here we are, you know, this year EEE is growing. And uh, when the infection takes hold, symptoms cascade violently from a mild flu to near incapacitation over the course of about one week. Wow. So we have that to look forward to in the Northeast and other places, but still, even in the West, this is where they, you know, mosquitoes, of course, you don't, you want to get rid of standing water it's so pretty though. You know, this is where, well, I used to go canoeing these kinds of places with my husband, but there's always that, uh, that chance of getting bit. I got so many bites yesterday, just being outside. So do I worry about coronavirus? Do I worry about EEE, West Nile, Zika? No. You do what you do one day at a time.
managing community anxiety. That's really one of the things that uh, she was saying. We try to make people aware of the risks without sensationalizing. But there's so many people that there's still people that are so afraid they uh, they forget other things are going around in the world. So I suppose if you live in a community where somebody died or got really sick, that would happen. So I really want to go to the next article uh, because this is really long, but I, I suggest you guys read this whole article because um, it's really interesting. It really is. And I like the statistics in it, but it's very long and I, I, I don't want to take up the whole day with this since I've had, I have so many others. So um, it, it is, and I will put the links book hermit use ddt no sorry ah we don't use anything but neem oil and then for me i just use um oh citronella you can go yes all right we're gonna talk after because i have some books and then I, I mean i have some things like i do i'm gonna show you a book we're, we can talk about this the Le the lost book of herbal herbal remedies and there's a lot of things in that book and you can find things right on your property but again i digress we're going to go to the next uh even in the city. We're going to go to the next article. This is the uh, contagion. It's a contagion live infectious diseases today. We're not going to spend a lot of time on this, but it does talk about the uh, Eastern equine encephalitis and uh, pretty much the same stuff uh, from the other, but a little more statistical. They analyze the t statistics and they say that um, deaths occur a median of 12 days after you get, so you get bit 12 days, boom, better have your will done. Uh, but in this one, that they, they don't have a vaccine. So prevention depends on community and household efforts to reduce vector populations Let's see, applying insecticides and reducing breeding sites. This is the hard part for me. I don't, we don't use anything on this property on natural. But then the farmer across the street, we don't know except we know manure, but we don't know, although he hasn't mowed yet this year. Um, repellents, again, you can get natural things, but that's a little bit right not into this one. Uh, the next article I wanted to pull up because the first article talked about climate change and mosquitoes and, and, and all of these things. So in Yale Climate Connections about a year ago, they talked about the research suggesting climate change could enable mosquitoes to evolve more rapidly. More rapidly, more mosquitoes could worsen the spread of mosquito-borne diseases like malaria, dengue, and Zika. So we talked about this already, that the mosquito is pretty much the most deadly of things, but it is a natural predator, I suppose. It is like, uh, is it mother nature's birth control? I don't know. Um, saltwater crocodiles get a lot of votes, but, uh, black mamba snakes, but really it's mosquitoes. Number one, mosquitoes, the who they report 700,000 people around the world die from vector borne diseases each year. So they're called, there's the uh, chikungunya, the West Nile virus, Zika, yellow fever. I mean, every year. And some of them are carried other by things other than mosquitoes. So this is pretty wild, you know, we're, we're in the grips of this coronavirus. Yet I think according to, Everything I'm reading, so many other things kill so many people. And I'm not dismissing the coronavirus. My thing is that I just want to bring you information on that 700,000 people a year from these types of illnesses every year. A lot of us in the United States don't think about it because maybe we do live in a place that sprays. Not me, but. Massachusetts, Rhode Island, the Northeast. I would be first online with a picket sign. But uh, so this article 
this they, they modeled mosquito speciation rates over the past 195 million years and found a strong correlation between the rate of speciation and the levels of atmospheric CO2 and temperature with faster rates of mosquito evolution when temperatures were higher and more CO2 was present. So what does it mean? The evolution of mosquitoes certainly would raise the possibility of many bad things, such as triggering the return of some uh, regionally eradicated diseases. A faster evolution of mosquitoes would definitely mean challenges to human beings. If the warming and the high atmospheric CO2 keeps going, there would be more species, so the population would be more diversified. There would also be more places, because it's warmer, where the, the mosquitoes could breed. Thus, these mosquitoes would have population growth, bringing higher density. So what are we going to do? Spray everything? What are we going to do? Live inside? Are we going to get white suits? And are we going to wear masks the rest of uh, until extinction? <laughs> And these species, they would pose and they will pose, and it looks like they're starting to pose more burdens on public health. So there you go on this article. They're finding that mammal speciation is linked to mosquito speciation. It's unsurprising, given that mammals are predo the predominant source of food for many species of mosquitoes, like me. They ate me yesterday. <sighs> And as they evolve, no one knows precisely what might happen. We don't know what'll happen, but they talk about dengue fever. Um, they, they, they talk about uh, many parts of the world, old city centers where people live are located near ponds and parks and other areas where mosquitoes, you know, love it. They love it, right? They just love it. And uh, what, what do, what do the scientists that work for companies like Bayer and for the big pharma companies and the, the pesticide companies, they're just going to make more. And an administration like the Trump administration will, of course, take the corporate side and deregulate because they already have. And maybe we'll try to get rid of mosquitoes. But again, we're just going to then kill the bees. We're just going to pollute the water. We're just going to kill the fish. Um. Uh, my next article is <coughs> actually from a, um, a little honeybee, little bee people, right? And they, you know, this little website is cute and they talk about this. They're beekeepers. And they say that in Washington state, they have worked with them, but they spray and they, they do control burns. But she talks about the spraying schedule in San Diego. So it's not just the East, right? The spraying schedule in San Diego before the internet, it was published in the paper. But she said she doesn't even know how it's done now. Uh, she said that the, the bees, basically the bees, they paid the ultimate price. And then she talks about how much notice for where you live, but the collateral damage specifically from an environmental point of view, the collateral damage from such spraying must be huge. I live about a hundred feet from the Atlantic ocean. I can't understand why mosquito planes are allowed to fly over the ocean and the Florida Bay dropping these chemicals on aquatic life. Doesn't Florida have enough problems? <laughs> she said, my first thought was that the native bees, the ones no one can protect, there's just, it's like she mentioned it to her husband. His first thought was birds. Either they eat poison insects and fish or else there's nothing left to eat and the birds starve. They can die either way. So it's a, it's a vicious circle, basically. You want to get rid of the mosquitoes for human beings not to get sick and then, uh, you devise the chemical compositions to do that. And then at the same time, you get rid of the bees, you, you know, and that's, that's like just a miserable, a miserable choice. There is, there is no choice to me. So should you now consumer reports there, so should you? And they say, 
you know, they're talking about hiring a pest control company and uh, about spraying. But I wanted to go down and basically get over here. Spraying is serious business. And the EPA has approved a number of pesticides for residential spraying, saying they are generally safe when used properly. Generally safe when used properly. I don't believe it. <sighs> Any chemical spray poses some risks. Now, they're talking about hiring some clueless moron that just says, well, let me spray for you. And, you know, you give them 50 bucks, these sprays. But that's, you know, that's an uh, inexperienced sprayer. They say, don't waste your money with those people because... Misapplied chemicals can result in more toxins reaching your children and pets, and they can harm natural foliage and non-threatening insects. Yeah, all insects, they're non-threatening except for the mosquito, right? They can also breed insecticide resistance, which means we need more chemicals, and that will make anything worse. But they say right there, start with the simple steps, which is way before you ever consider spraying. You should try, you know, the, the basic things, eliminating standing water, pet dishes, old tires, bird feeders, planters, things like that. Re repair your screens, windows. This one, uh, use air conditioning when you can. <sighs> I guess that's going to be more and more, right? As we get warmer and warmer. Keep your lawn mode, using fossil fuels to, to, to uh, <laughs> discourage ticks. They like long grass. Well, I have really long grass in the front, but I'm not going through it and we don't have a dog. But now this is a, the, the, a EPA registered insectant repellent. That's the stuff you buy over, uh, over the market. And it's the stuff that a lot of us have used. You know, it's not raid, <laughs> but it's like, it's like raid for your body. Uh, but it's interesting, you know, what they say. I don't know. Let me see what ones are EPA, the best insect repellents. I like getting from my Amish neighbors because it's all natural stuff they use. Um, I don't know where it said. Oh, I see. Woodland scent. But what's in these things? We'd have to really, you know, okay. Why don't we make our own lemon eucalyptus insect repellent? You know, make your own. And that's where I have the book, this book, or buy from the Amish because, at least for me, or buy from your, if you live in a city, buy from a natural place. Try to use everything naturally you can. And, you know, I wish I knew what the farmers were using in the uh, uh, here in this county. A lot of manure, I know that. All right. Now the piece de resistance. This is the piece de resistance, and I'm really glad that you're all staying with me because this guy I found, and I have to tell you, he is, this is, uh, this is really good. His name is Colin Purrington, and he's a photographer. And he, I found him because he had been talking about all these companies' names that and what the toxins are that they sell that kill the bees so these are the companies mosquito authority mosquito joe mosquito platoon mosquito shield mosquito swad true green all these companies that imply that uh, the insecticides they spray on yards are safe for everything except mosquitoes now he really did a nice job compiling and I'm going to go through this for another few minutes and we're going to go through so and see if these names are familiar to you. He did this research. I didn't have to. And I thank him. And I actually want to write to him. Uh, Mosquito. Okay, so these companies use Bifenthrin, Deltramethrin, Permethrin, Jamba, Cyclothrin, Permethrin, D. Allerthrin, Bifenethrin, Bifenethrin, or Cyclothrin. And he says all of these are either pyrethrins or pyrethroids. They are natural and synthetic neurotoxins that cause almost instant paralysis and death 
to mosquitoes. And here he shows the chemical structure. Uh, and he invites. He invites you to email him if there's a disagreement. I don't have a disagreement. I think he did a great job. And I'm bringing it to you because I felt this great job. Are they safe? relatively safe, but they should not be viewed as harmless. If you spill enough on your skin, you might experience itchiness, numbness, nausea. And so he says, you know, they have a slightly different toxicity. Um, and they can kill you if you, <laughs> some, uh, well, and for pets, dogs, chickens seem to be fine. Cats, however, lack sufficient levels of a liver enzyme that helps detoxify pyrethroids and can thus develop what is called pyrethroid toxicosis. A good indicator of cat sensitivity to pyrethroids is the standard warning of keeping them away from pyrethroid-treated dogs. Ugh, you know how when you have a pet, I keep my cats in, I don't put any pesticides on them. But I've had dogs that my beautiful one dog, Sasha, had such bad flea dermatitis. I had no, it was in the 80s and the 90s, and I had no other recourse with her than having to use what the vet gave me. And, well, she lived till 17, even with hip dysplasia, and she was an absolutely beautiful shepherd chow chow. It was my first, my first baby. Now, do they kill other animals? Yes. They kill mo and he re he references he he puts his uh his references in. They kill monarch caterpillars even weeks later due to the presence of insecticide dried onto milkweed leaves, and the spray can kill honeybees even if honeybees are inside their hives uh, when the pyrethroids are sprayed. And, and the worker bees, they bring the small amounts back to the hive the following day if they land on treated plants or if they find small puddles of water to drink. They can change the honeybee behavior. And if you watch the video I created, you'll see. And I'll probably play it at the end again like I always do and I add on 16 minutes to the show. <laughs> but if you see it, you can then just leave. Um, they kill fireflies which are most active in a yard in the late evening. I had a lightning bug last night. I was so excited. Uh, now, this he says his favorite group of unnoticed insects that are killed by the uh, are solitary bees. There are approximately 4,000 species in the United States. These are the bees that collect pollen and nectar during the day, but they spend their evenings and nights in holes. Mason bees, for example, or clamped to low vegetation. And then he has a picture of the um, two-spotted longhorn bee. A lot of different kind of bees. Everyone has dozens of species of native bees in their yards, but few people realize it. But they are amazing pollinators and almost all adorable. So when pesticide applicators claim that their pyrethroid sprays don't harm bees or are bee friendly, that is entirely untrue. It's simply a marketing slogan they were taught when they bought the franchise and they insist it's true even when presented with evidence to the contrary. My God. You know, anyone using a spraying service is therefore killing all of the above and more. Insects are small and easy to ignore, but if you were to go out after spraying and look very carefully, you'll find thousands of dead insects on the ground. And only an extremely small percentage would be mosquitoes. If you go out immediately after spraying, you can even see the twitching that precedes their death. It's probably not a pleasant way to go. Pyrethroids can kill all anthropods. In fact, not just insects. So if a yard is sprayed, likely 100% of spiders, mites, centipedes, millipedes, they'll be at risk. In total, that could, make, that could mean tens of thousands of individuals left twitching in treated yards. In one estimate, one alone, an acre of land in Pennsylvania contains 
425 million animals, and a good portion of them would be killed by pyrethroids. And another concern with gassing them all in the yard is that of bird species that eat the anthropods. They will have a lot less to eat. And then there's the fish. You know, we know that populations of swallows and flycatchers, for example, have dropped in the last several decades. And, you know, one explanation is there are fewer inse insects to eat. And, there, and we know this by the car. We know this when we drive and you turn on your turn on your lights at night and you have like so many less than the fish, which were acutely sensitive to pyrethroids. Franchise owners will generally avoid spraying their people's fish ponds and bodies of water. Indeed, by law, pyrethroids, pyrethroids can't be used near water, though there are many reports of franchises ignoring that regulation. You know, think about Florida, where all those golf courses are, and uh, they keep them all unnaturally green and unnaturally beautiful uh, beauties in the eye of the beholder and in Florida a lot of them have uh, like moats or waterways around them where crocodiles live think about what they're spraying on those golf courses just think about it you don't even want to know they're also toxic to earthworms. And, and, and you see, he says, to be honest, many people don't care about earthworms. Some hate them. Some hate them. But um, they're here for a reason, right? But for people who love aerated lawns, it should be pointed out that fogging with py pyrethroids might result in dramatically less aeration and dramatically more odor from rotting earthworm carcasses and perhaps result in robins that wonder where all the worms have gone. These are, they're engineered to last for weeks. Now in this company, how can the barrier spray to continue, continue to kill mosquitoes for 21 days? Mosquitoes will feed on plant juices when they attempt to feed on sprayed leaves. The residual from the spray will kill them and everything else. But mosquitoes don't eat leaves, <laughs> of course. But the quote is correct about the fate of insects that walk on treated leaves. Pesticide franchises like to claim that once their product is dry, it's no longer toxic. But that claim makes no logical sense in light of their claim that the product provides protection for three weeks. So some of these can even last for 90 days if they're on a shaded uh, surface. So he goes on to talk about these companies and what they're doing to neighborhoods, to environments. He said, um, there's some state laws and here in New York, for example, most counties in New York require that neighbors be notified 48 hours before spraying. In some states, Maine, you can get your name on a notification registry that requires that any applicator to contact you in advance of spraying. Gosh, I'm so happy we don't have any of those places here. And at one point in time, I was a clueless moron and I did have my yard sprayed a couple of years uh, because of the fleas. And then I learned I can't do this. No, no, no. Uh, and, and then there's an option for beekeepers in some states, too. So they have to know because you saw in my video the, the beekeepers that have lost. Now, this guy that wrote this lives in Pennsylvania and uh they have a pesticide hypersensitivity registry. You know what's funny about Pennsylvania? They frack the shit out of Pennsylvania. They're polluted as all hell, but they have a pesticide hypersensitivity uh, registry. But that's good. So when you're on that list, you uh, the pesticide applicators know you have a medical issue with pesticides, and they are obliged to inform you of any future spraying. And also on that registry are beekeepers too. So... 
you can you can um, use Ecosia and you can say pesticide notification um, laws regulations in residential and whatever state and you can you can see and local governments can help too it's it's really um, they they have a, a, a web page that tells you everything about what's going on you have to just look it up and uh, there's tips for towns you can inform your town go to these websites if you go to a town meeting and you're concerned local governments should consider banning automatic pesticide foggers which are pipes that deliver these pyrethroids on a timer just like those automatic misters in the grocery aisle there's things you can do but you have to understand that they're happening and state governments should really look at the false claims now in in each state you know unfortunately things are so politicized that new york probably has better rules than let's say florida um and floridians might be seeing advertisements of young children playing outside which is conveying like a sense of that it's harmless to do this but uh, he says that a lot of these sites that advertise have misleading wording and uh, that, of course, especially the claim that these pyrethroid containing sprays target mosquitoes and ticks. So is spraying effective? Now, we're getting to the end. What do you think, guys? Is spraying pre uh, uh, effective? It might be a good way to kill mosquitoes near the ground and in low shrubs. A lot of them spend their time high up in canopies and they're untouched anyway. So let's say he says he doesn't want to say it's ineffective. They will. And they might get rid of the vectors of dengue, yellow, and Zika because the species are more likely to be in lower vegetation. But uh, I don't think that, that there are more genre of mosquitoes, of course. So depending on where you live and what's growing in your yard, pyrethroids might vary in effectiveness. I honestly, he's got then 10 suggestions for doing that. And he's talking the same thing. And I'll show you, uh, the eliminate the stagnant water, thin out ground cover, deploy traps that kill pregnant females, all natural, add mosquito killing bacteria to standing water. Make larvicidal traps. Make a fan trap to kill foraging females. Buy a thermocell. Now this says it, it's a, I think it's something, it's a, a noise maybe, possibly. There are those thermocells, the electronic things, they sell them, you know, the bee bug, bug catchers, but you don't want bees to get in there. You don't want anything that's not supposed to go in there to go in there. Wear tro clothes treated with permethrin. Now, I'm not sure about this one. Um, if it go, it's an insect repellent on your clothes instead of on your body. And only registered repellents if you're going to use a spray. <laughs> and make a sugar trap to rid the room of mosquitoes. I like a sugar trap. There you go. See, to me, and he says, don't waste time on or money on mosquito control myths and scams. So to me, I like the sugar trap. So we've gone full circle. We've talked about from the very beginning, and I'm going to bring up some comments now. We've talked about what happens and why and these illnesses that are mosquito born and what do we do to try to get rid of them and the sprays that are toxic and how we're harming the populations of bees and all. And it, and it just is it's pretty uh, tough because no matter what we do, we are damaging our environment. We are. And I don't see it changing in this administration because they've already, Trump administration is already relaxing these laws. I did my video on the regulations that are being uh, rolled back. It is a serious issue. It's enough for me not to, I'm definitely not going to vote for Trump, but it's a very serious time. Environmentally, which is what we are about, there is something I could talk about if I wanted to talk about seven days a week. There's so much out there that's going on to destroy the planet. Hi, Tina. 
She says, hi, Aunt Tina. If there was a flea collar for chiggers, I'd wear it. I wear the treated clothing, clothing because chiggers are horrible. Oh, well, that's good to know. So the, the, the treated clothing, that sounds like it might be a good way. If um, I know that there are mosquito, uh, um, there's mosquito clothing. There's very light. I've always told my husband, why don't you buy one of those when he's outside getting bitten to death? Why don't you buy uh, uh, the clothing, you know, instead of being out there with your shirt off, put a white mosquito proof something on. Couldn't we do that? All right, let's go all the way back. Topical issue. Pakistan is being ravished by the move of the locust swarms and are fighting this with insecticide. What's the alternative? I don't know, Mike. Somebody had written a comment, eat them. <laughs> catch them and eat them. Oh, I don't know. That's a, another show. Maybe you could help me. Email me some information. Um, Pat. Hi, Pat. Your interstitial lung disease is the result of spraying for mosquitoes and spiders. Roundup in particular here in Nevada. Oh my God. Wow. Wow, wow, wow. <laughs> Raza car windshields are pesticide free. Use them. <laughs> I really appreciate you guys coming. I hope that you got a lot from this. And yeah, hit the like button and subscribe if you're not. You know, I, again, um, I don't get the views that a lot of other people get. And I put a lot of my heart and soul into my shows. And it is my mental health um, reliever, no matter how difficult the topics are. And I love you all for being here. Hi, Heidi. Heidi says she detests chemical spraying and she knows how much harm that it causes our ecosystem. My friend Tish Hinoja wrote a song devoted to her childhood exposure to such chemicals in Texas. See, there's always a cause for every issue. And I am sure that there are organizations that definitely will will do that, that, that any city that's spraying uh, write petitions and protest and all. Mike said bioaccumulation is real, which is probably of this of these pesticides. Um, now this is here. Pet cats are killing three billion birds a year in the USA. I don't know about the statistic. I've read it. I don't know where they get the statistic or the accuracy of it. It could be happening. And that's because people don't take care of animals and they've let them procreate. What went from a pet is now, you know, they're going to say cats are um, nuisance, nuisances. Pretty soon the hunters will be told, oh, go ahead, go shoot off some cats if they don't do it already. Aww. Um, let's go back. Golf courses are an environmental disgrace. Well, they are because they're all pesticides. They're all using, they all use pesticides. Um, Heidi said, what else can we do to prevent these pests? I know that uh, companion planting is supposed to be good use in the garden, but does that help people? Well, again, this is, you know, if, if you want, and we do another show on this. Oh yeah, neem oil. It can kill, kill garden pests, but hurt pollinators. There is a neem distillate that spares pollinators called Azimax. Well, thankfully, we, we've only used a little bit and it's so far away. We don't have, thankfully, we don't think there's any pollen. We don't know. And I will admit that. So thank you for that. Thank you for that. Okay, Heidi has a question. So many friends are getting sick from Lyme disease. How can we vent, prevent the ticks that cause the devastating disease? What else can we do to prevent these pests? I know, she said, companion planting again. So these are all things for the next, the next episode of how to deal with, you know, bugs, uh, insects that, that bother, that could hurt us, that could kill us, that could hurt our animals without killing bees, without killing the nurturing important ecosystem. I mean, our ecosystem, everything works in tandem with the other. That's why it's an ecosystem. Oh, Wade said, you suspect your wife got cancer from all the neighbors using Roundup. I am so sorry. 
it makes me so angry when I go to Home Depot. Well, I don't go anymore anywhere, but when I went and I saw right in the front, right in the front, the shelving roundup, and I just get disgusted. I can't understand it. I just can't understand it. And it's illegal in other countries. It sure is. Well, we're going on an hour and, uh, I'm glad to hear she's okay now. Thank you so much. I really do hope, and Poppy, hi, Poppy. Hi, Poppy. I didn't see you were here. I really hope that um, that you guys enjoyed this. And Marco said, catch and release, spaying and neutering. That's what I do. I have five cats, but yes, that's exactly what has to be done. And I think everyone should, especially where I live, should do that. And, uh, and, and yeah. Well, Jean, thank you. I guess I'll show the video again. It adds eight minutes. If you've seen it, um, you don't have to stay. I'm going to say peace out. Thank you so much. Um, my Saturday night, I, I'm not 100% sure if there's a show yet with Jennifer. It is that time of year. And it's hard to do Saturday night shows when the weekends are so jam-packed with just everything around here because, again, we live outside. So thank you so much. Uh, we may have to go to Friday nights. I'll be back on Tuesday and I have a guest next Thursday. Thank you all. Peace out. And I will put the video on. Namaste. Triple E. Triple E is a serious illness spread by infected mosquitoes. We had a very active Triple E season in 2019. And because this disease comes in two to three year cycles, we want to be sure you know how to protect yourself and your loved ones. Our strategies to control mosquitoes include spraying from trucks and from the air to kill adult mosquitoes. Spraying can help temporarily reduce mosquito populations and their ability to spread the virus the spray does not persist in the environment. When done at the right time and with good weather, aerial spraying can be useful as a risk reduction tool, but it does not and cannot eliminate that You risk. need them. That's how you get berries, nuts, seeds, all the different food items that we eat that goes into one third of our diet. Pollination from bees helps sustain a third of our food supply. But Mary Phillips with the National Wildlife Federation says those bees and our food are now under threat. Thanks to two new policies from the Trump administration. It's very uh, daunting and frustrating um, to see. The EPA just reapproved the pesticide scientists say is especially harmful to bees. The Obama administration banned it back in 2014 to protect an already dwindling population of honeybees. And what effect the pesticide will have on bees may be harder to track because the USDA is also suspending its quarterly count of bee populations and disease outbreaks. More than one third of the world's crop production is dependent on bee pollination. They are the most important pollinators of our fruits, vegetables and flowers. Did you know that without bees, it is predicted that humans will only have four years to live? In recent years, we have seen a decline in the bee population on a global scale. Pesticides are affecting the bees both lethally and sublethally, and is thought to be one of the main contributing factors of colony collapse disorder, which was first identified in 2007. Every batch of pollen that a honeybee carries home as food has at least six detectable pesticides in it. Neonic pesticides are currently the most commonly used and controversial. Their main difference to most other pesticides is that they are systemic, meaning that they are absorbed by the plant and are present in all areas of the plant. The honeybee takes in the pesticide with the pollen. Bees are a superorganism, meaning they are a social unit which have a highly organised division of labour. They rely on the colony as a collective unit to survive. The process of foraging is a highly complex phenomenon comprising coordinated individual performances. Sublethal effects of pesticides are known to negatively impair bee behaviours such as foraging efficacy, communication dances, orientation and return flights. 
Poor individual performance leads to poor population dynamics of the whole colony. We're up here in the wooded area of Point Loma, and this is a non-commercial beehive. Now, the couple that has this beehive has two others, and they've been doing this for over three, even four decades. But one of the two other beehives, it's critically ill. So we had a look in the hive, and we found hundreds of dead bees on the ground outside the hive. This is one of the two healthy hives the Terrans tend. It was back on August 10th when they saw signs of the poisoning. And then a couple of days later, the layer of dead bees outside was maybe two, three inches thick. Um, and there were more sick bees all around the hive. The die-off was devastating. Before this happened, when we looked in it, we would estimate that there were somewhere around 40, 50,000 bees. Now there are probably four or 5,000 bees left in it. Don believes the poisoning happened accidentally when insecticide was sprayed on flowering plants. Um, honeybees will choose to forage up to a mile away from the hive. Then the bees would pick up that insecticide and take it back to the hive and poison the hive from the inside. Well, this is uh, evidence of toxic chemicals, probably neonicotinoids. This is kind of what I experienced last year. got shadow there put it over here this is a fairly young bee it's not that old and they really act sick they they bounce around when they walk they kind of don't walk very well this is not from virosis this is from toxic chemicals pretty much acts normal but it's not normal I don't have a lot of these but enough to make an impact on the colony strength in my colonies see that's not right insects don't die like that naturally this is man-made chemicals doing this to this bee. And what they do is they walk out of the hive and they manage to get away from the hive aways and don't ne they don't necessarily die in the hive so you don't know that you're bun you have a bunch of bees dying because you're not in the hive anymore. They wander out and die elsewhere. It's just a sad thing to watch. It really should be criminal what's going on in this country, that corporate America, mostly the bear companies involved in making the neonicotinoids. And with the effect that it's having on honeybees like this, you know it's got to cause cancer in humans. It just takes a few years. Because bees are very sensitive to the environment. They die quickly from stuff like this. In humans it takes a while. But that's just not not good and we humans don't do anything about it or us, us regular people the rich people are the ones that are doing this to us as regular people we don't seem to speak up and protest beekeepers don't want to seem to get together and protest and uh, boycott the almonds in California to make a statement every time I talk to a commercial beekeeper try to get them to do that it's, oh we need the money Money's more important than anything else. Look at that poor bee. Probably just started foraging the last few days and got to the wrong flowers. Flowers that had neonicotinoids on them. It really pisses me off. If the government ever collapses, I'm going to go around and take out a bunch of crop farmers. i got a list of crop farmers in the area that have been uh, poisoning me and my wife for many years. Payback's a bitch. <laughs>